Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. I'm really loud. I'm sorry, sound guys. Um, <laughs> anyways, I'm here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, why you should get your app into user workflows. Uh, thanks so much, though, for coming to this conference. It's been an amazing event so far, right? New, yeah, there we go. There, there, there. New Relic's been doing fantastic. Um, I'm so so happy to be here. Uh, I'm I'm the last speaker of the day, and this has been a constant thing at conferences. So I think the conference organizers are talking to each other and saying like, this guy drives people to drink, um, <laughs> and so then they put me right before the drinking. But uh, New Relic got it wrong because you have a coffee break after this, then a keynote, then drinking. Uh, so if you pull out a flask or something like that during this presentation, I understand. I don't know why you'd be coding Python during this, but bad jokes. That's why I drive people to drink. Anyways, <laughs> that, yeah, this is like Conan O'Brien. Um, I don't have the hair, though. Uh, so anyways, I'm going to talk today about uh, disruption uh, and why I think it's a bad thing. Uh, before I get really started, I want to tell you my talk slides are online. Uh, you can find them there, or you can follow me on Twitter, Q. Highly recommend that. Good follow. Um, I'm Nick. That's my face. Uh, I'm a developer evangelist for SendGrid. Uh, and for who here knows about SendGrid? Who here has heard of us? Who here has uh, used SendGrid? Very cool. So um, for those of you who have not heard of SendGrid, we're a company that makes sending and receiving transactional email really easy. What's transactional email? Well, transactional email is emails like, you forgot your password. Here it is. And uh, such and such wants to be your friend. Or here's the receipt for the item you just purchased. Uh, and by the way, we sent all those. Uh, but we also send one other email. Uh, and those are like workflow emails. Uh, and it falls under transactional. But it's an email I started noticing. And I think it's a really interesting email. So there's this app called Sunrise. <laughs> and Sunrise, what it does is it recognizes that people don't look at their calendar in the morning, or they forget to. Have you ever forgotten to look at your calendar? It's terrible. It's because you, you get into work at 9, and you're like, oh, there's three meetings that I'm supposed to go to right now. Uh, don't recommend it. So Sunrise makes sure that you can, uh, that you do check your calendar. And how does it do that? It emails you, because it knows that you check your email every single morning. Uh, so we send a couple of these kind of emails, and I started noticing them. I thought, man, that's really, really cool. Uh, this is, is something that works for me, and people are doing it. Uh, and so I started looking at like the deeper, deeper level. What, what is that? Um, and I, I, I realized that it, it stems from this thing, and it's something that you guys might have experienced yourselves, right? You go and you, you start working on an app, and you put a lot of love and hard work, and you make that app grow into something really just beautiful. And then, then you get featured on like Hacker News or TechCrunch or something. And users start coming like crazy and you're really excited. Or maybe you don't get featured, but you, you just start getting these users because your, your app's getting traction. But then they just kind of disappear uh, and don't use your app. Uh, I don't know if this is something that's happened to you, but it seems to be a general trend. Uh, there are lots and lots of articles if you go Google like Hacker News Bump or something like that. People will see users come in and then they leave and don't use the app. Uh, in fact, 26% of users download an app, open it once, and never reopen it ever again. Uh, the next percentile is 17% of users only open an app twice, and it goes down from there. It's crazy how little, or how, how little engagement there is for some apps. Um, and so I think that's because it's disruption. And as an industry, we love disruption. We have conferences around disruption. We go to coffee shops. And you know what you hear at the coffee shop? This industry is ripe for disruption, right? Yeah, yeah, you guys heard that? Yeah, I've said it a couple times. Um, and we love in disruption, but I think as a part, it's really not good. I think, you know, when I say disruption here, I mean like making a user open your app or making a user go to your website and go to your website rather than Facebook that's disruption. You're disrupting their standard workflow, what they're doing on their day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so maybe a better word for this is modification, right? Uh, and modification change, uh, there's actually been a lot of study in that. Uh, and one of the things that's been studied is the trans-theoretical model of change. Uh, this model is, uh, it, it, it came from uh, behavioral healthcare science, and it's this like unified model of, of change, and it takes in internalities and externalities and 
models it all into one thing. It's kind of like what Einstein was searching for if Einstein was Freud and uh, had a little bit of Daniel Pink thrown in. <laughs> really loved making that slide. Uh, <laughs> um, so what's this model say? Uh, it says that there are basically stages to change. And like I said, you see this, it, it was developed for uh, addiction and behavior research, but you see it pop up everywhere as, as different names. It's called uh, the universal change model, uh, lots of other names that I'm forgetting, but lo lots and lots of things. Uh, and what it says is there are these steps that happen in change. And the first one is pre-contemplation. This is where you have an issue. And you don't know you have an issue. Uh, you, you're, you're missing your meetings or something like that, but you, you just don't know it. Um, or you know that, that that's happening, but you don't think it's an issue, right? Uh, and so in, in an app context, that's what it is. Uh, then comes contemplation. Man, I'm missing meetings. How, or I'm, I don't know about them. How can I fix this? Uh, but you don't do it. Uh, then comes this preparation page, and this is where like, oh, I'm gonna fix this. I'm going to make this happen. Uh, and you go search the app store, and this is really cut down because it's an app download and not getting unaddicted uh, to something, <laughs> breaking a habit. Uh, and then, then you go into action, and this is where you hit the download button and buy the app or, or start using the website or sign up for the service or whatever it is. Uh, and then comes the hardest phase. And this phase is maintenance. Uh, Change, maintaining a change is really, 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 really hard uh, because it's really easy to fall back into uh, what you used to be doing. Uh, so I have this theory. Why don't we just, oh, and first of all, you can jump off this model at any time. You can jump back somewhere else. You can leave for six months and then come back into the contemplation phase or whatever, and it's just a pain. And you have to, you have to get users through every single step of this model to get them using your app? I think that's ridiculous. I think you should just step on in in the pre-contemplation phase and put your app right there where they are. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, uh, there are lots of things your users do every single day. They wake up, they get their coffee, they drive their car to work, right? Uh, and if you can get in somewhere like that, that's amazing because then your users are using your, your app, your website, your whatever, without even knowing it. It's just part of their daily routine. Uh, and you can make sure that they keep doing that. And I think that, that that's a really exciting thing. Uh, so it, you're getting into their workflow. Uh, and when I say workflow, I don't mean like, well, Sally f gets a document faxed to her and then she uh, goes to the copy machine and she makes 200 copies and forwards it to the whole office via the inner office mailing system. Like, I don't mean workflow like what you do at work. Uh, really, uh, what I mean is kind of like life flow. What, whatever you do in your entire life, uh, this, this is what, what I want you to get into your users. I, I want you to get into your user's entire life. Um, but life flow is a made up word and I don't have the credentials to make up words, so I'm gonna keep using workflow. Uh, but know that, that that's what I mean. Um, so how do, you, how do you integrate it into somebody's life? That's, that's actually a really difficult question, right? Um, and I think there are, there are a lot of ways to do that. Uh, the first thing you need to do is you need to look at what they're doing every single day. And, it, and for each instance, this is going to be really different to your company. Um, <clears throat> and probably they're not going, it's not going to be you're integrating into their uh, alarm clock unless they use some really fancy alarm clock. And you're not integrating into their uh, coffee because they don't have the really fancy coffee machine. And you're not integrating into their car because they don't have the Ford that they're really hawking the API for. Uh, by the way, check that out. Like, car APIs are awesome. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they do do other things. Uh, they do email. Uh, I'm a little biased. I work for an email company. But they also use their calendar every day. They use their social networks every day. There's a lot that people do. Every single person does every day. Uh, there's also a lot of really unique stuff that maybe your user does every single day. Uh, if it's a developer, may, they obviously log into their terminal every day. If it's a salesperson, they probably check their phone every year, like get on their first phone call of the day. There's something your user does every single day and you just need to identify that. Um, and so I'm up here and I'm, I'm telling you that I think this is a really good idea, uh, but there's no reason you should believe me because uh, who am I? Uh, but there are lots of companies who've actually made this work. So one company uh, that did this is a company called Eventable. Uh, they're a company out of Berkeley, California. Woo! Uh, I live there. I think it's a real cool place. Uh, but what they do is they, they give businesses, brands, uh, companies like Macy's, 
a little little button on their website that says, follow our events. And this isn't just like some weird thing. You, you click the follow our events, and it's subscribed into your Google Calendar. So now when Macy's has an event, it's put right there that, hey, you can get a free lunch or something like that. And this is really great because their users, those, those people, are already looking at their calendar. I look at my calendar, um, or I look at it through Sunrise or something. Um, <clears throat> so this is powerful. It's so powerful that events see an 86% increase in turnout. That's incredible. Uh, you know, you click through rate or whatever in, in internet marketing, it's like 20%, that's awesome. Conversion rate, another 20%, that's awesome. So you get down to like, what is that, 4% uh, being an awesome number. 86% increase, that's insane. Um, another case study, uh, I done this. Uh, they were a company founded at a hackathon. Uh, and what they do is they realize uh, users want to, people want to know what they accomplish each day. And they want to keep some sort of record, like, like a journal basically, but uh, of tasks. And uh, it's not something they remember to do, right? I, I've tried keeping journals. I can't do it because it's not something I remember to do every day, like go right in it. Um, I done this goes, you know what? People do do something. They send, they receive their email. They're constantly in their inbox. So if we send everybody an email at 5 p.m. or 4.45, right before they're calling it a day, and say, hey, just take a second, write us an email, reply back to us uh, what, what, you, what you do, uh, what you did today. It goes into a calendar. You can go see it. It's it's really cool app, but you're using it without leaving your inbox. You you almost don't know you're using it. You're just answering your email like like every other day, and this is what's really exciting. If you can get a user to not know they're using your app, but to be using it constantly, that's really exciting because because you have users, but you also don't have to really support them in that way in like your app way. Uh, so I I think it's really cool. Um, I done this has 25% daily active users who respond, not, not just read the email, but interact, respond back and use that. 25% for just sending an email. That's, that's a really exciting number as well. Um, so this leads to the question, how do I do this? Um, well, uh, I work for an email company, uh, SendGrid, so this is how you probably should do it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you can integrate into a lot of things. You can integrate into outbound email. Right, you can send your users an email every day, like like I done this, uh, and then you can actually parse it as well. You can get their inbound email and read what they said to you, uh, and this is also really exciting. Uh, this is something that you see uh, in apps like Airbnb, where you're messaging the host and it goes into your email, and you can respond back to the host just using your email. Uh, for you guys as developers and myself. GitHub's a really great example of this. When one of your coworkers makes a pull request, right, or uh, a commit, and you respond back, it goes into a comment, right? That's all inbound, outbound email, and you, you don't have to jump onto GitHub, you just have to use your email. That's really, really exciting. Um, yeah, so use SendGrid for that. Uh, <laughs> um, and then also, I think there's a really, really cool way to do it, uh, and that's actually get into their inbox. Um, so you could you could put yourself like on the, on the right hand side like uh, Reportive does on Gmail, uh, and there are lots of actually apps that will help you do that. So there's uh, this one company called Context.io, and they have a way to actually build widgets in Gmail really really easily uh, because building in Gmail is a pain. Trust me. Um, so that's a really cool thing you can do. Uh, Context.io, not their core business, but really cool anyways, and check them out. Uh, but you can also write yourself a Chrome extension and get into your user's workflow in their Gmail inbox. Uh, and this works really well for Reportive, for Serious Insight, uh, for any of those browser extensions that get you to use them. Uh, one note on this, though, uh, it, it does require a little bit more. Uh, to get inbound, outbound email, for outbound email, you just need their email address. For inbound email, you don't even need that. You just need to give them it. Uh, so you get into their workflow really easily. For in the inbox, they actually need to install something, so you're putting in some friction in there. And really, you don't want to add friction when you're trying to get into somebody's workflow so you are a frictionless experience. It's weird. So that's how to do uh, email. Uh, you can also integrate into a calendar, and I think this is also really, really exciting. Um, you can do it through an iCalendar feed. Uh, and so there's this open standard that says this is how events are, are seen and parsed. Um, I believe it's XML. Or no, it's not. It's this really weird like text-based thing. 
or uh, it's not delimited very well. But uh, a anyways, uh, you can get in this, and you can immediately get into iCal, Google Calendar, uh, uh, Microsoft thing, uh, Microsoft Office, the their thing, uh, just by integrating. <laughs> I don't use that. I'm in startup land. <laughs> um, so you, you can get into that. Uh, you can also use CalDAV, which is, uh, again, another generally agreed upon protocol to modify calendars. Also very exciting to do. Um, again, requires, both of these require installs. For a calendar feed, what you have to do is you actually have to give them a URL and then they go click it, add to my calendar in iCal or Google Calendar and paste it in. Uh, for a CalDAV, they actually need to give you your calendar credentials. And that's actually really hard to get. People are very, very protective of the calendars. Uh, it causes no end of issues when people don't want to give you their calendar information and you expect it. Uh, so that's that's the one to shy away from, but it can give you a very, very deep integration. Uh, the next thing is Google Calendar API. They don't have to give you credentials, but they have to OAuth in. Uh, that's real nice because it's OAuth. It's really easy to use. People don't have to think about it. They just click, yeah, I want to use this app. Um, and then the next thing is Calendar Invites. This doesn't require an installation. You just invite them. Uh, but what a calendar invite is at its heart is an email with a calendar uh, with an ICS file in it. So really that's an email integration, but it works really well. Um, and that, that doesn't require really any installation except knowing their email address. Uh, the next thing, how do you integrate into uh, somebody's browsing? Well, that's a really good question. Um, you can use a browser extension. Uh, and so that that's a uh, Easy-ish to do, but they have to install it. Uh, Chrome takes a lot of the, the pain out of that with their extension store, so does Firefox. But you do have to send them to a site and then say, click the plus add button to add our extension and then accept it's uh, viewing all your website data. So some people can be a little bit wary about that. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> but the good news is they're all open source, so you could read it if you really wanted to, but no one's going to do that except for maybe five of us in this room. Um, <laughs> Then this is my favorite one. This is how you can not do it by uh, not not requiring installation at all. Incredibly creative use of retargeting. So I don't know how many of you guys know what retargeting is, but retargeting is this thing where you give a visitor a cookie, and you then have Google or some ad network follow them around. It's why when you go to SendGrid's site, you are then followed with SendGrid ads for the rest of your life. Uh, you you might have also seen it with like Amazon and other companies like that. But you can actually go down to the precise user and the precise actions. So if you really wanted to and you had a lot of ad budget, you could actually put your app onto other people's websites by using retargeting and then they'll click into your app uh, because you gave them actual useful information. So I really want to have somebody do this. If you do this, like email me, I will promote your app to hell because that's really cool. Um, <laughs> Next, how do you integrate social? Social is another thing people are using every day, and I don't talk about it very much. Uh, but I think it's a really, really good way to do things. Uh, you can see Twitter's done this with uh, Event Parrot. Uh, if you follow Event Parrot, it will DM you every uh, every time there's a major event. Um, and it's getting into your workflow. I'm already using Twitter. It's not something I think about. I just get a DM. Very cool. Um, so first thing you can do is uh, via mentioning get into people's workflows. Uh, they don't require an install. All you need is their Twitter handle. That's really cool to do. Um, you can also, when I say mention, I this can go other networks too. Uh, App.net maybe. Uh, Facebook is a little bit harder, but you could maybe figure it out. Uh, messaging, that's something that an install is pretty much universally required. Somebody needs to be a friend. Somebody needs to like your page. Somebody needs to follow you. Uh, Following is kind of like an install, right? Um, next thing. Following, that's that's really a social integration, right? You're getting into somebody's workflow. You're getting into their timeline, whether that be Facebook or, or um, Twitter. You're, you're actually getting into them uh, and getting into what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. So again, install required. Um, but how do you integrate into anything? This is a really good question because your users, although I think they use email every day, and I think they use calendars every day, and I think they use social networks every day, they probably use something that's actually more related to what you do every day. Uh, and that's something you need to ask yourself. And really, the answer to how to integrate into anything is be creative. Uh, you need to look at what they're doing and apply it. Um, and I'm going to leave you. Uh, I'm, I'm running really short here. I, I wanted to give you 15 minutes for questions, but we'll have a lot of questions, or you guys can go drink sooner. 
Uh, <laughs> woo! Had a lot of that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this is good advice for life, for uh, relationships, for anything. Change is hard. Don't expect people to change. Try and change for them to make things work. Uh, get into your users' lives by getting your app into it before they have to click into it. Make people use your app without knowing that they're using your app, and you'll get a lot of users who are really, really exciting people uh, to have. So that's, that's me. That's Disrupt Nothing. Do you guys have any questions? Hey, random friend in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> What? Yeah, so push notifications are a really great way to actually get into somebody's uh, uh, workflow, I guess. Uh, and so, yeah, it requires an install. But if, 20, if near 100% of people are already opening your app and you do it on install, like, that's a really great way to do it. And it's something I didn't mention here, but uh, there are a lot of really good ways to do push notifications. You can make your own server. You can also use something like Urban Airship or parse if you're going for a really deep integration and get pu push notifications really, really easily. Anybody else? Cool. Well, drinking. Oh, yes. Other random plant. <laughs> well, so I, I didn't play him either. I just know you two. <laughs> Yeah, can we start? Can we coin life flow? Like, okay, tweet tweet it that life flow is a new word or something. <laughs> I, 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 anybody here from like a dictionary? <laughs> Somebody want to edit Wiktionary right now? Um, <laughs> so, um, I, I, an example of uh, integrating into offline workflows. Uh, you know, there's some really good ones uh, that I'm clearly not thinking of. Fitbit. Fitbit's a really good way. Yeah, thank, thank you. You should be coming uh, doing this. Um, <laughs> yeah, Fitbit's a really, really good example, actually, because you're, you're using it on, your daily, on a daily basis, but you're not thinking about it. It's just on your wrist, and you actually integrate with it. Yeah, see? You're using it right now. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. You don't change your pants a lot. <laughs> So, I've, I've yeah, geofencing. geofencing. The integrate the NSA is. <laughs> NSA original life flow integrator. <laughs> All right. Anybody else that I know want to ask a question? <laughs> Anyways, thanks so much for coming. Um, I'll see you guys drinking. Uh, I'll, I'll expect to be part of it, um, or at least the reason that you're drinking. Uh, so thanks so much. <laughs>